This episode of Why We Bleep is sponsored by Signal Sounds. Did I ever tell you the other day about my friend Jason? No. What were you saying about Jason? Well, Jason is mad. Mad? How? Jason has decided to take Signal Sounds and go completely independent. Yes, the madman has got his own store, is moved digs, is totally having a go of it, and is putting a ton of money into the whole venture and is attempting to have a go of it completely independently. He's trying to start a completely independent retail store in the United Kingdom in 2019. Is he completely and totally mad? Yes, he is. But... My God, I think he's going to do a bloody good job of it because Signal Sounds are a bloody good retailer. They've got bloody good advice. They know what the hell they're talking about. They love the things that they sell and they're keen to get it to you quickly, easily, have as much interesting stuff in stock as possible so there's the shortest route between you and your musical joy. So, support the newly independent signalsounds.com and check out all the rad new shit they've got in stock, including the Abstract Data Octo Controller, eight channels of modulation, pulses, wiggles, loopable voltages, all manner of wonderful things, and completely malleable by hand, the kind of thing you can use during a live show. Who does that? Anyway, for your modular and other joys, talk to signalsounds.com. I'm sorry, what was that? Signal Sounds. Dot com. Why? Why? What is up, mate? I know it's been a few months. Sorry. Sorry. I know. Um, I'm sorry. I've had a life which has gotten in the way of making little bleeps. Uh, Well, that's not true. I say making bleeps, the podcast, but bleeps, my God, bleeps have been occurring in the background like you would not believe. It has been a busy few months for myself. Um, But unfortunately, that meant I didn't have the opportunity to post a podcast. But this all changes Now, um, podcasts are starting again. Thank you for weathering the interruption in service um, as we continue. And as I say, stuff has been happening. My God, it's not like nothing's been going on. Um, Numerous things, more things than I can tell you about here. But I'll tell you the first thing was that I played a gig in Bristol. I don't know if you've heard of this little town called Bristol, but every city in the United Kingdom is a winner in my eyes. Every city's got its strengths, but I think Bristol, it must be said, at risk of singling it out, has got a kind of unique cultural um, vibe to it. It is uniquely solid and uniquely strange as well, uh, for want of a better term. So the event is Machina Bristronica, which was put on by the people at Elevator Sound, which is a shop in Bristol that sells modular synth gear, an extremely cool shop, um, and one that I can liken... uh, When you go there, it's in this place called Stokescroft, um, and Stokescroft is a place full of fascinating people (laughs) by turns culturally interesting... I mean, there are some real characters in Stokes Croft, and if you've been to Stokes Croft, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is a heck of a melting pot of a place. Um, And so everything's happening, and this shop, Elevator Sound, is just on the high street there. You know, there's amazing food and coffee and things and just stuff happening all around it. Club down the road, Blue Mountain, which I've played at before, actually. And the shop is kind of like a barber shop. That's the best way I can put it, because it does not cut hair, it, but in the sense that a barbershop can be like a community hangout space. Like, you go to Elevator Sound and you just kind of hang out. And when we were there, they were putting on the event, and the guys were packing, there was people from different brands, there was people from Elevator Sound, they were constantly like packing boxes and putting together goodie bags and things for the event the next day. Um, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and I rock up and like hug the guys, hello, and they just sat out on benches, people are drinking beer, is, and so the, the kind of activity of the shop spills out into the street. Um, and there's just the kind of the, the 
you know, mad life of Stokes Croft occurring around it. And this, just this little business that felt more like a hangout to me. Um, and so, and there was Ben Divkid there. And, um, and so the whole kind of synthy community decamped to Bristol. And that show was amazing. It was one day. It was the first time it's ever been put on, but it was mega, super, hyper vibrant. It was packed. I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there. Um, tons of manufacturers. There were workshops and stuff. There was Tom Whitwell and uh, Music Thing, obviously, and Thonk was there, you know, doing kits, building you know, workshops where you could build kits and build modules with Tom helping you do that. Um, talks and stuff, that's where I got to interview Steve Davis. Steve Davis, um, which was an interesting interview, and you should be able to hear this. I think, I don't know if it is online yet. I think it will be, it will be eventually. Not an easy one. Steve, is, he's funny, because Steve's like, I mean, he's a character. Obviously, he is a raconteur, and he's used to being interviewed. And it's interesting then interviewing him on a subject which he professes, very self-depreciatingly, but he, he professes to not be a professional at. Um, he's very much uh, an amateur by his own admission in terms of music making. But then I saw them play, and they were playing really great stuff. It was lovely, like kind of almost sort of kind of spacey ambient crouch rocky vibes probably not what he would describe it but he's got a lot better musical knowledge than i have um, but we had an interesting chat and it was funny uh, he is a uh, yeah a character and what a what a crazy thing and then i played a gig at bristronica and i had the uniquely strange pleasure of playing after Steve and and the, the group. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the gig, I'm setting up next to, and I was saying to Steve, I was like, that was brilliant. It really was. It was really lovely. He's like, oh, thanks very much. Thanks very much. And then I'm set up and I'm like, he shakes my hand and he's like, have a great set. Steve Davis said to me, thanks, Steve Davis. I will have a great set. Thanks. <laughs> Life is strange. Life is strange that these things happen. And it was a good set, and it was a good set because I had a secret, and my secret was thus. A few weeks before, um, my friend Finley Shakespeare, who you will know from Future Sound Systems, had posted on Facebook going, someone book me for something, damn your eyes, because Finley obviously loves to play live, and in fact actually has been playing with Blamange and touring and playing lots of really good gigs. And um, when Finley obviously he's singing, so he's playing modular, he sings, which is amazing, and wonderful, um, and he's great at it. And by the way, if you haven't bought his album, what the heck's wrong with you? Go buy his album. I will link it. And so Finley posted this. I was like, Finley, I will give you fifty quid to sing through half of my Machina Bristronica set. And he's like, all right, go on then. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah. So I'm like, sweet, this is going to rule. <laughs> and so I saw him earlier in the day, obviously before the gig, and was like, all right, so I'm on at five. So 5.30, you rock up. I will leave space next to my modular. You will rock up next to me. You will bring your little, like, part of his system, which is his kind of live vocal um, which is like a mic input, but he's also got like filters and delay and he's got like a clouds in there as well. And so uh, he can mess his voice up and he's like, yeah, cool. I'll come and plug up next to you and I'll plug you in and we'll go. And I'm like, cool, this is going to rule because it is one of those things. Vocals have a unique power to just transform. Uh, and I don't have a very easy way of getting vocals into my system. Uh, I use a radio music and I just loop little like bits of spoken word and stuff just to create like, you know, that sort of techno vocal loop, but it's very hard. And I would actually love to have singing over some of what I do when I play live. I kind of hear things in my head and when I make my own music, I do sing poorly, but I affect the crap out of my voice and it's fine. And so anyway, I'm looking at my watch and I'm playing and it's all going very well. Um, and then I'm like, where are you, Finley? Come on, mate. <laughs> it's 5.30. And then lo and behold, up he rocks. And what pleased me so greatly was that I didn't announce that I was doing this. Uh, and so the people who knew who he was, because he'd played an hour or so earlier, um, or just knew who he was in general, had no idea this was happening. And so I've been playing techno, and then up he rocks, and then I play techno plus Finley Shakespeare's vocals. Um, and again... 
if you haven't heard Finley Shakespeare's music, you do actually need to do something about that because he friggin' rules. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I like him very much or his modules or anything like that. I actually genuinely like his music and he's, he rules. He's just got such a good approach. Like, I don't know, it's just vocal stylings are just brilliant. It was delightful because instantly it elevates the modular music. And so I could put effects on him, but he was putting effects on his voice and it just elevated things enormously. Anyway, I'm going to post this set. So unfortunately, like a complete mug, I forgot my GoPro. So I don't have video of it, but I do have all the audio. So there will be a video and maybe a SoundCloud or something like that where you can hear the whole set and I'll post that. So look for it. It was ace for want of a better term. Uh, that is more deeper and profound. And um, I was very touched by uh, Alice, uh, who asked afterwards, which was like, did you practice or anything? Like, you must have rehearsed. I was like, no, <laughs> that was the very first time we ever played together. Um, but yes, birds of a feather flock together, make modular music together. So that was a thing. And the one other thing, or two other things I'll mention, is this a small event called Moog Fest which is in Durham, North Carolina, not Durham, County Durham, which was wonderful. I had a very, very lovely four days in Durham, hanging out with Mr. Alex Mayolo, who is extremely kind in uh, encouraging them to uh, book me to come over and also putting me up in his wonderful house. Alex and Charlotte are great human beings. And Alex plays with the band triple x snacks with like three x's which is a semi-ironic name for a very good band uh, and they played shout out to alex and charlotte shout out also to spencer ultra billions and my patrons of whom i hung out with you know who you are uh yes durham's a lovely place there's lots of good food chicken and biscuits that was a real one chicken and biscuits at rise rise my God, those sorted me out a few mornings. And just a beautiful and lovely event. I was sort of doing workshops. I was showing people how to use the mother and the D fam together, which was nice. And then I was able to interview Amos Gaines, which is the subject of today's podcast. Amos is the product design engineer for Moog Music Incorporated. So Amos has got some serious chops to talk about and is just a wonderful human being to speak to as you're about to find out but the other thing is i played a gig with my iphone uh, in a sort of surprise way because uh, it was just not really worked out beforehand uh, except i have been using my iphone for more than a year now to make music in a variety of different ways in fact i've been using my iphone to make music for several years but in the last year, I discovered this app called Synthesizer with an X and no E on the end when I went to Iceland. And it's just this wonderful, really simple polysynth with a sequencer where everything's in key. And I discovered if I just had a metric hectare of reverb and delay, I could just make these lovely, repeating, orb-like melody experiences. And I was just really enjoying using my phone and just making these little loops and just exploring them and changing them and fiddling with the sound and then fiddling with the loop. And so I did a whole hour set with just that and a few other bits and bobs. And it's the subject of a video which I've made, which you may have seen, but I'll also link to. And it worked surprisingly well. And it was pretty cool to be able to do that because that's a weird thing to do i mean it's not because there are loads of people who are using ios to make music and have been doing it for a lot longer than i have and you know a lot more legitimately except that at a show which is you know from an equipment company and which kind of most of the acts obviously are using hardware and it's a celebration of of equipment and gear lust it's also a technology festival and so i think it is completely appropriate and also a nice statement to say that you don't need any of this stuff to make music you don't need it obviously you don't need it but you don't you can make music with your phone that's a thing and there's absolutely nothing stopping you blending that with your hardware or doing you know 
kind of medium sort of combos of those. So you're actually still using your hardware and your phone, and there'll be more on that because I've been doing it. But it's a completely legitimate way of making music. And it was really cool to actually be able to do that and sort of make a little bit of a statement, half jokingly, but half truthfully, that you don't need it. Because you don't. With that said, I love equipment. And so do you. And so it's always nice to have some of it. But not too much. Not too much. Finally, there was Superbooth. And in terms of new things, I want to shout out the coolest thing that I saw at the whole show, the Squid Sample by ALM, which is an eight slot sampler and you can record into it, but that has just got the ability to have hundreds and hundreds of samples in banks that you can play and you can play them. You can hit them with a gate and they'll fire or you can play them, you know, chromatically. And so you can actually make melodies. And I think you could play a show with just a squid sample and ways of triggering it. And I'm a big fan of things that you could just play a show with if you have pretty much that and nothing else it's like an absolute monster of sampling i think is going to be really really interesting to see what is possible because there are lots of things in eurac that let you put samples into them and all of them are great in their own ways but there hasn't quite been one that solves the whole like banking bank issue i think quite in such a straightforward way where you can sample into it, create banks. You can have tons and tons of stuff. You could have the 707, the 606, the 626, and the 727. Um, You could have all kinds of kits, everything at your disposal, and you could recall them live and be banging through these drum machines. And best of all, you could have breaks. You could have drum breaks, stuff that you just wouldn't normally expect to hear in a modular set. So I'm dead excited about the potential of just sampling and having samples in my modular. Shout out also to the Proc Drums, P-R-O-K, which are made by Steve from Thonk. This is a little sideline, which is basically a synthesizing drum module where you've got a kick module, a snare, a hi-hat, and a clap. And... With those four modules, it, to cut a long story short, they because they are DSP-based, you've got a potentially infinite amount of drum sounds that they can make, and they really kill on a big system. They are DSP-based, and you can program them to make what sound synth sounds you want, and you can modify them live. So it's also, you know, in answer to the a couple of the drum-related things that I've been wishing for, having loads of samples, the Squid Sample lets you do that, and having malleable drums that are like analog drums except in a small space well the proc drums are kind of that because you get to change the sound you could actually design it so you could have tons but they're dead small and they sound banging and you should try them um more on them soon because i got them and i've been trying them and really the winner of super booth is the vegan gyro uh, always a winner smothered in garlic sauce um how do they make that stuff taste so tasty i don't know but they do and apart from all that techie stuff gigs and others there are two things <laughs> i've one um attempting to buy a house and potentially succeeding and the last but most important one of all a small genetic experiment that my wife and i are conducting which seems to be going very well indeed uh more on that in late september so, <laughs> better get some videos done ahead of that. Anyway, Amos Gaines from Moog Music Incorporated. We sat down to have a chat and it was pitched as how to make a Moog synthesizer. So this is, that was the theme, um, but it was a bit of a Trojan horse because really it was how to get Amos Gaines on mic and just be able to ask him about stuff and chat for a and best part of an hour and that's basically what happened although we do talk about how to make a Moog synthesizer because that is very interesting he is the product design engineer at Moog and that means that he is hugely influential in the design of machines that they make he does tons of work on the interface and the kind of firmware side of things but is obviously also involved in design you know, Moog is still a relatively small company, um, despite what people may think. It's like some kind of hyper-super megacorp. 
it's not. Um, it's a very um, small and groovy company. Obviously, it's based in Asheville, North Carolina, and they produce all their machines there. It's still a sort of small, tight-knit team with a very, very kind of groovy, positive company culture. The company is employee-owned, actually, of the last few years, which is amazing. Um, and so I was able to sit Amos down in front of a live studio audience ask him about growing up and his experiences with this kindly old man that his family knew, uh, who was called Bob Moog. And Amos at the time didn't know who Bob Moog was when he was a young lad. He came to know it more, you know, as time moved on because Amos's interest in synths was inspired by family. And he goes on to talk about how he got his job and how things kind of worked back in the really early days of the modern version of Moog, which is, you know, 2000, 2003, thereabouts. And kind of now how it is in the current state. And, it, you know, we talk about what makes a Moog synth how they develop products, avoiding feature creep or being the feature creep and the development and execution of like the subsequent 37 and of course the mighty Moog One, which is his kind of latest, latest beast uh, and is still ongoing. Of course, they're still actively developing that machine. So lots to talk about with Amos and he, um, He's just got like this wonderfully sharp and lucid way of talking about things. Combined with being a musician himself, he's just one of the most interesting people to chat to. I just really, I really like listening to him talk. So, enough from me then. Let's speak to Amos Gaines from Moog Music Incorporated. Cheers. Is yours, are you on? Is everybody in? Are we all here? Is everybody ready? Yes. I'm like, how long have we got? We've basically got all evening to talk, so. There's nothing else on, right? No, this is it. <laughs> We're a little bit of a surprise performance today, I think. Um, so thank you everyone for coming and for Hi. sitting. Thank you for coming to Moogfest, obviously, and thank you for coming to this session. And thank you, Amos, for very generously giving your time to my pleasure. Happy to be here. Thank you, man. Um, so the session is called How to Make a Moog Synthesizer, um, which has a very specific purpose, but uh, I recognize fully that Moog, you know, synthesizers are not made by companies, they're made by people who work for companies. And so this is kind of for, as me for an excuse to just talk to you as well, Amos, and kind of get your take on what you do and your background as well, because it's Moog, you know, all, all companies are made of people. And Moog has some really wonderful and interesting people. I think you are definitely one of those people, Amos. Oh, thank you. Definitely uh, far from the only one. You, exactly, true. But, but um, you have a very sort of, um, you know, an influential role, I suppose, in, in what you do and how you um, help shape the future of music technology and what, you know, the things that we can be creative with and, you know, explore our own creativity. So, um, I suppose we should start, what, what is your official job title? And in a Richard Scarry way, what do you do all day at Moog? Oh, sure. Um, the last time I checked, I think my official job title is product design engineer. Okay. And uh, that's something that uh, Mike Adams, who just walked in, uh, every few years, hey, occasionally he'll uh, make up a new title that may <laughs> or may not have a closer association with what it is that I'm doing. And, and part of that is because... Um, you know, what I do all day is incredibly diverse. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I feel fortunate that I get away with doing what I do for a living. It feels a little bit like that. Yeah. Uh, because truly, I mean, I have always been passionate about and fascinated by music technology. Um, you know, it's what I lay awake thinking about at night. Um, and... Uh, it's just, you know, sort of at the core of what I'm into. Yeah. And so I'm in this tremendously fortunate position that by sharing and exploring and getting deeper into what I'm already into, uh, a ton of other people appreciate that also. And so, um, you know, so, so my, my day to day role is sort of an outgrowth of all of those different interests and areas of fascination. Yeah. Um, over the past 
six or eight years, maybe longer now, but at least at least you know maybe let's just say the last decade or so, uh, writing firmware has been a large part of what I do. And uh, you know I went to school uh, for mechatronics here at NC State. Well, not literally here here, but at NC State. And uh, it, mechatronics is essentially robot building. And I think robots are cool, but the reason that I chose that field of study is because it encompasses all of the same techniques and technologies that go into making synthesizers. So you've got something that controls analog circuits in the real world, you've got some logic and decision making going on in a processor somewhere, and you've got inputs from sensors and switches and buttons and things like that. So all of the same building blocks that make a functional robot also make a functional musical instrument. And um, so, I started out as the repair tech at Moog 15-ish uh, yeah. years ago now. Can you talk a little bit about just going back even further, mm -hmm. like let's go right back to the start first and then come to the present day. Sure. What, where, where, where did you grow up? Where was your sort of origin? Um, and yeah. can you talk a little bit about your first experiences with sort of music, music hardware, and with Bob Moog as well? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I think my earliest memory of synthesizers, uh, I have an older brother, he's nine years older than I am, and he was into all, you know, he was into all the stuff that I later thought was cool, you know, partially because, you know, he was a, he was a big role model for me. Yeah. Um, you know, so this was, this was sometime in the 1980s or so, he was like a member of the Church of the Subgenius and into Devo and the Residents. And good brother. Yeah, no, that is super, super, brother. he was, he really, yeah. really turned me on to some good stuff, like at a very, very early age. And so he lived in the basement and had this weird lair full of like black lights and, and modular synthesizers and, you know, skateboards and- so he had modular synths. And uh, he, he had an Aries, yeah. an Aries, uh, yeah, if yeah. you know that company. Yeah. So he had an early DIY modular synth. It was like, you know, things were always breaking and coming loose and it was really fiddly to, uh, um, to work on. But fundamentally it was a modular synth and it was capable of making all of these whacked out crazy noises mm. that, you know, we think are so cool. Was that the first modular that you'd played on as well? Or the first electronic music instrument? It was, yeah, yeah, it was. So I was, you know, maybe eight years old or so. Didn't know what any of this stuff was, except it was incredibly cool. Yeah, and uh, and so he also, you know, he made me mixtapes with, uh, you know, lots of early electronic music on it, um, and so that was just sort of like my my introduction to this stuff. And so I grew up thinking, this is really cool. This is really interesting. Um, and around maybe eight or nine years of age, uh, my folks moved from Connecticut, where we were living at the time, down to Asheville, North Carolina. And um, as it, you know, uh, my family is Jewish. Bob Moog is a member of the Jewish community in Asheville. And through that association, I came to, you know, Bob would come over for family dinners. And, you know, so as, as a, like a nine or 10 year old, here was this really interesting, kindly, smart, creative person who just had like a really, great vibe about him as yeah. anybody who's met bob will tell you he was just just put people at ease and made them feel welcome he was really present he was really just interested and you know just had this incredible energy about him and so that was my my first introduction to bob moog was just as this beautiful amazing person who my parents knew i didn't i didn't know i was into synthesizers and I had met Bob Mogan, thought he was cool, but it was a few years before I put all these things together and was like, oh my God, this is the guy. This is. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. How could you not have known? Or... I was eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> a nice guy. Yeah, but so, wow. so, you know, so gradually I did put all the pieces together and, you know, I continued living in Asheville, grew up there, went to, you know, went to the local schools. And so when I was in university uh, years later, I needed to work and I thought, what is the coolest thing I could possibly conceivably do for work in this town? Definitely going and applying to Big Briar as it was yeah. at the time. Yeah. And although I, I, I missed an episode actually, when I was about 13 or 14 years old, I built one of the first uh, Etherwave Theremin kits that Big Briar came out with in the mid 90s. Yeah. And so, so my first hands-on with a piece of Moog equipment was an Etherwave Theremin that I built myself. And how, how was that to learn and Oh, it was experience? great. It was yeah. fantastic. I mean, I had played around with those, uh, I don't know if, I guess I was going to mention a Radio Shack. I guess you had Maplins. Yeah, we but, did. Yeah. yeah. So, Tandy, so, it was called. Yeah. Tandy. Yeah. So, so they had those like 101 electronic project kits with the little wires and springs. And, and so like I, I, I had those growing up. And so I had, was, I had built simple circuits and kind of had a basic understanding 
uh, you know, at that level of electronics. Yeah. This was the first like using solder, making a real PCB type thing, but it was all the same concepts that connected together. And I could tell already, you know, this was something fascinating. There's something magical about taking, you know, some pieces of carbon and silicon and copper and hooking them together in just the right way and firing them up and then they do things yeah. and they're alive and, and they respond to you. Like th that, uh, having that experience was really formative for me. Amazing. And I still like, that's still almost my favorite part of the process is taking something that's just, it's, you know, some inert pieces of, of physicality that are nothing but potential, and then you fire it up and it starts doing things for the first time. That moment never gets old. It's absolutely brilliant. Teaching silicon to sing, basically. Yes, yeah. yes, nice. I love that so much. So how do you get a job at Moog? How does one get a job at Moog, for those who want to know? Um, <laughs> persistence. That's Mike, maybe. Uh, persistence was key, and it still is. Um, one of the things about working at Moog is it's, it's a family and there's a very strong sense of um, we, we don't want a lot of turnover. We want to create long-term jobs for people that can support them and support their families um, you know, sustainably. And so part of that means that, you're, that they're not quick to hire someone that might not work out essentially, um, you know, the idea is to really invest in every, I mean, we're employee owners, yeah. you know, so everybody, everybody who gets hired on has a stake in the company. So it's even more important to support that person, to find the right person, invest in them, uh, and ensure that they're going to have, um, you know, have a successful time of it long term. So uh, essentially, one turns up with a good attitude and the desire to be there. Um, and uh, typically, you start as a temp and you know, spend a few weeks or a month, I don't know exactly how long it is, uh, working in a temporary capacity, and then if everything works out, you're still happy, we're still happy, um, you know, then it can become full-time. In my case, I turned up saying, hey, I'll make coffee, I'll sweep, anything you know, that you need done, in existence. I'll do it. Um, and they say, you know, Moog at the time was about 12 people. Wow, um, you know, is this like 2000, what, 2003, 2003, or 2003. I think. Yeah. Um, and so, so it's maybe a dozen people, including everybody from, you know, Mike Adams and Bob to, you know, the front office, production staff, shipping, everything. Uh, and there simply weren't any positions. Yeah. They were not hiring when I first turned up. Uh, so I came back a month or two later and same thing, came back a month or two after that. And after about six months of turning up every month or so saying, hi, hello, I'm still here. I still desperately would like to do anything I can possibly do. Uh, I had finally given up and I'd put in an application at the local movie theater. Right. Uh, you know, very, very dejected. And if my memory, this could just be like, you know, uh, I may be over dramatizing it, but I think it literally was the same day. Uh, I got a phone call and it was Bob Moog. And he said, hi, Amos, this is Bob Moog. Tell me, can you solder? <laughs> and I well, said, what yes. You say? You say yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, I had soldered. It was technically true. I was not a professional at that point, but I did made a theremin. So I had made you, a theremin by gum, and product. I was going to take that to the bank if by I possibly golly. could. <laughs> uh, and so as it turned out, their repair tech had put in his notice because he was going to go off to grad school. And consequently, there was an opening if I could get up to speed on all the schematics. And, um, you know, so basically I came in, I had a week with my predecessor and with Bob, and they started me with, at the time, there were three Mogerfogers. So they started yeah. me with the low pass filter and the ring modulator and the phaser and sat me down with a schematic. Here's the input. The signal goes here. This is an amplifier. You know, the signal goes through there. And did then- you, Did you truly understand what those things were at that point? Or was it, how comfortable were you with these concepts that you were being <laughs> dragged into? Um, I was very game. Okay. I, um, my, my outlook was, I'm a pretty clever guy and I have some familiarity with this stuff. I am just going to throw myself at it 120% and not mess up and not let these people down. Amen. And, okay. um, you know, mas o menos, I mostly succeeded. And, yeah. you know, it got better with time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they believed in me and supported me. And uh, Bob was an incredible mentor. He was always willing to answer questions and sit down with you. And, you know, typically uh, a question, answering a question would involve getting out a piece of paper and a pen and drawing a simple schematic and pointing at the things. And he was just so giving with his time and his knowledge. Mm. Uh, that I really, I owe a lot of my success to that generosity of spirit and to that yeah. willingness to, um, you know, to just explain, explain it one person to another. You know, there yeah. was no, 
Um, uh, he just really treated treated everyone as as a peer, and if you were interested, then he was glad to share his knowledge. Yeah. And uh, you know, so that was um, you know that was that, and just the attitude of I'm I'm going to do this and make this work. Yeah. Um, At all costs. I get success. the feeling that's kind of how it is now. Like, obviously, if someone comes to you and asks a question, you're not going to be mean about it. It's oh it's no, quite I mean, I, I yeah, I, I, I owe it to you know to the experience that I've had to pay that forward. Yeah. How would you describe the company culture? Like, what is it like? Not just Bob, but but everyone who's there now. Like, what is it like to work there? Um, it's honestly, it's amazing. The people there are have such a good attitude. Uh, it's so positive. Um, there's really everyone, you know, we all believe in what we're doing and that it is, you know, fundamentally worthwhile and good and useful and makes people happy. Yeah. And there's something about a climate where like the end result of what everyone is doing is, you know, more happiness, more creativity, like more good things in the world. Uh, I, everyone gets the sense that like, this is what we're doing. And the, you know, the, the reasons why we're doing it are, are so just good that, um, you know, we, we get to, uh, to do this and yeah. to share this with one another. And so, so everyone there is, you know, it's good vibes, it's positive, it's supportive. Most of the people who work at Moog are musicians themselves or, you know, or passionate music fans. Um, and it's so, so there's this great sense of, uh, sharing a really wonderful adventure and experience, uh, and it just it makes makes for a wonderful place to work. Mm. It, it attracts. I found that the people that are drawn to synthesizers and electronic music and new sounds they tend to be open minded. They tend to be about you know positivity and you know creativity and curiosity. Yeah. Um, and those personality traits just make for uh, really great folks. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good community. So, um, big question, um, before we talk about how to make a Moog synthesizer is what makes a Moog synthesizer with a big underline on Moog? Because there are lots of different synthesizers, there's lots of different synthesizer companies, but there is only one Moog synth. So what, what is the defining characteristic? Wow. That's that is a big question. <laughs> it is a big. Um, we've, got, we've got forty minutes. The, all right, there, there are there are a few different uh, sort of levels at which I would look at that question. Yeah. Um, there's the technical level. There's you know what is it about these circuits that if you put them together you get something that is you know recognizable and recognizably different from from other people's circuits. Um, and then there's sort of the gestalt, the experience you know, of using the instrument as a whole, mm. and. While I think that there is, you know, unmistakably Moog sound circuits have a signature to them. You can, you know, you can pick them out on a record if you're familiar with them. You can hear them and just know. And um, that is, uh, th that's a number of things. A lot of it has to do with the way that Bob used transistors, I would say. Um, you know, transistors were hot new technology when Bob was getting started making synthesizers. He'd grown up with vacuum tubes. And so, uh, and you know, Bob was a curious and creative person. So he took this new technology and really was like, okay, what can we do with this? How can we, you know, and how can we make things not only, you know, less expensive and more reliable, but what can we do with this as a musical component? Yeah. And so the result of that is mixers and filters and oscillators that you know, they don't just sound, they sing. Like they are mm. tuned by, and Bob was a musician himself. You know, he played, played piano passably well, although he was very humble about it, played theremin, you know, loved me. He had a musical ear yeah. um, and worked very closely with, you know, very high level musicians. So I think the sensibility of the person who was tuning those circuits, voicing them, you know, you're not just, you know, if you get something to oscillate or you get something to filter, you've done the first part, mm. but then voicing it the way a luthier voices a violin. Yeah, yeah is the next piece. And Bob really did that with his circuits. And so the end result of them is something that a musician has tweaked until it has some resonance, some sort of characteristic that is inherently pleasing. Yeah. And so each one of the circuits has that aspect to it. The mixer distorts in a particularly pleasing way. The filter obviously rolls off frequencies in an unusually pleasing way. And all of these are conscious design decisions which combine together and, and the sum of all of those 
voicings and those musical design decisions gives you that, that character that's so immediately recognizable. Mm. But more than that, and I think this is where you know, my personal work is, is, is focused, is creating the total experience of interacting with a musical instrument like it is sort of your collaborator, your creative partner. You have, uh, it's not just, you're not just using a machine, you're in a conversation with this, this other entity, not to get too mystical about it. But, <laughs> I know you, well, it's true though, it's know, like, it is an but, interaction. Yeah, and I guess like, part of what makes a Moog synthesizer, like a lot of people tend to go in that sort of mystical direction a little bit when they're talking about what it's like to explore these sounds and what it, what it feels like to really get lost in the creative process and the sonic exploration process. It really does, like I think it speaks to people at a very deep level and making design decisions that support that experience, that guide you into that experience and don't you know, shake you out of it due to some frustration or something that's counterintuitive. Uh, part of what I do is use an instrument and, and pay very close attention to what it feels like to be using that instrument and what, what do you notice, what do you, you know, what do you do intuitively, where do you pause and have to think. Yeah. And, and analyzing that experience and saying, ah, okay, we can, if we move this control over here or arrange these things horizontally instead of vertically, you know, it's those subtle touches that keep you in the flow. Yeah. And that, you know, like a successful Moog instrument to me is one that really naturally supports that flow. The when flow you're where you don't have to think about exactly. it. Exactly. I've heard a Tom Herb of like uh, the Herb mm. Verb and other things say, he was like, um, from dialing in the herb verb, I asked him, like, how do you know when something is done? And he said, uh, when I just lose hours and hours. When exactly. I'm just, when I'm just <laughs> suddenly look up, I'm like, oh my God, I've been doing this for like 45 minutes. Right, then now. you've nailed it. Yes, yeah, it's, that's, that's it's done. done at that point. Um, so at Moog, how do, how do products come about? And how, do the, how do ideas get greenlit? It's probably still less uh, professional than what is, what is professional? <laughs> um, right, yeah, I, I, it, it's a very human process, yeah. and it's very collaborative and organic, I would say. Uh, I can remember from the early days when Moog was you know, fewer than 20 people, uh, basically everybody would get together around a table, and you know, maybe we'd order in lunch, and we'd all just brainstorm and yeah. say, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Uh, maybe we could do this. And you know, from those discussions, we would come up with a short list of the most interesting and compelling ideas and figure out which ones were viable and you know, see how it fit in with what we were already doing. Um, and, and then we would go forth and figure out how to make the things that we'd thought of. There is an extent to which that's still a part of the process, and I hope that it always is, because I think that that, um, that collaborative, that group brainstorming dynamic um, you know, everybody that works at Moog is there for a reason. Everybody has their own passions and interests. And I feel like the best ideas come from all of those different perspectives and interests um, inspiring one another. You know, one person throws out an idea and another person is inspired by that to say, oh, that, but also this. Yeah. And um, so that's, you know, that still happens. There are, we now we do off sites. There are a lot more of us. So we will you know, we will have smaller teams that will get together and brainstorm. But then day to day, we have an open office. Um, you know, all of the engineers work in, you know, sort of a big open room with, uh, you know, everybody can just circulate. And we have to balance staying focused and letting other people work with being able to just cruise over to someone and start talking about what they happen to be working on. That's it, nice. Right. But that's, some of the very best ideas come from that. It's the middle of the day, someone comes by, says, oh, hey, what are you working on? And you talk about it for a minute, and they say, oh, well, that gives me an idea. Have you thought about doing it this way? And oftentimes, it's a really great idea because it's like it comes up spontaneously in the course of just being curious about what we're doing. Yeah. And so, you know, so we just, we talk to each other, we share our enthusiasms, and we inspire each other. And from that, we refine and iterate um, and, you know, ultimately there are people whose nominal job responsibility is, say, um, uh, you know, product management, things like that. And, and it's those people's job to say, this idea fits really well in, you know, it continues to tell the story that we're already telling, or it, you know, it's a logical outgrowth of something that we've done before, sort of shaping the, the overall arc of not just this product, but where it fits in in, in the continuum. 
Uh, and you know, so there are people whose specialism is that. There are people like me whose specialism is, you know, how amazing and wonderful can the individual thing that we're focusing on right now be? Uh, and collectively, we, you know, we combine our strengths and we combine our perspectives, and you know, sort of very organically mm. uh, shape the future of what we're going to do. Doesn't sound like there's any one person that dictates. There's really not there really one person not that dictates, thing. and I think that that's important. Um, you know, it's it is in a sense sort of a. Uh, ideally, I would like it to be, and to a large extent, it is sort of a meritocracy of ideas. Like, you know, everyone gets to contribute their ideas, and you know, we all get to uh, feedback on that. And ideally, the best and most exciting and most interesting ideas are the cream are, rises yeah, to the top. Precisely. Absolutely. Um, so, can you talk us through sort of the stages of a typical development, if that is even a thing? You know. Um, no project is typical, yeah. and no project is easy, and no project is small. Okay. Those, these are things that we've learned. No matter how small. <laughs> no, no, yeah, there are no small projects is something we remind ourselves of, because okay. we keep fooling ourselves into thinking there, that a pro, you know, we'll, we'll do, okay, the next Moogfest project. Not a big deal, right? Easy. We'll Little Al always a big deal. Yeah. Um, but and a lot of work for something that just a small amount of people will have access to as well. Designing a product for a handful of people. It's... Um, it's a yeah, it's a very interesting approach, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's, you know, obviously it's compelling. Yeah. And, and well, it gave us the DFAM, for which I thank all, everyone at Moog. I'm, Steve Dunnington yeah. especially. For yes, Steve, Steve has truly, like, I love every year the opportunity to see where Steve's creativity like math, will... sort of science. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you ask how products get developed. There's a, that's another way that products get developed is... Hey, Steve, we need something compelling in about three months. Um, go for it, man. Go to it, mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so for, for the rest of us, that's always a wonderful surprise because, you know, he truly does have carte blanche to a large extent to, uh, to just come up with something interesting. That's and, amazing. Yeah. That feels like the sort of, yeah, the old school, like thinking of like the way that the Minimoog was developed where it was just... It was, it was made possible at Moog for a person to just take some bits, take some things, saw off the keyboard, grab an oscillator, you know, off you go. And, I'll right. just, and then I'll say, just, hey, look what I did. Yeah, look what I did, like, <laughs> cool. And just, just sort of be like a rogue agent within the company. Yeah. Like, it's good that you foster a sort of Absolutely. that on a yearly basis. Absolutely. And I think that's so important. And as, as you've seen, it does filter forward into, you know, into future designs that have a wider yeah. a wider reach. Commercial products. Yeah. So yeah, talk us through the, if the, maybe not a Moogfest product, but through something like, I mean, to name one is Moog One. Um, well, I mean, cause that's um, a big project to say. That is by still ongoing. far the least typical maybe project we're, that maybe, we've ever done. Maybe we'll come to it, maybe talk about subsequent 37 actually. That was, that's okay. Subsequent 37 is, yeah. is, is a good, is a good one to look at. It's sort of right in the middle. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't a ridiculous moonshot like the, like the Moog one, but it also didn't, you know, it was, it was planned. It was intended to come out at a certain time. Yeah. So, um, so the story of the sub 37 was that we had, uh, come out with the sub fatty and the sub fatty was intended to be specifically a low cost synth. So it was, you know, we took some ideas from the little fatty and some ideas from the Minotaur and wanted to create something that was, you know, that the goal was to fit a price point, the goal was to fit a size and to sort of um, the vibe uh, of that instrument. And it, so it was designed, that was the brief, was it needs to be about yay big, it needs to cost about yay little, and it needs to be fun and engaging and not too complex in these ways. Um, and so that came out, that's, this is the sub fatty I'm talking about, and yeah. it did well. Uh, and then there was, we needed to follow that up with something. And it looked like there was room at that point for, you know, people loved it and were ready for something more complex. And so the brief that we were given was start with the sub fatty architecture because we have that and we want to reuse it. But how can you just dial up the, the complexity and the depth and the, the interest to 11 on, you know, take, take this sound engine and just max it out. What's the most cool stuff you can possibly do with it? And so that was the design brief. And the way that that was done actually was to take a, a sub fatty circuit board and uh, create a, we, this was long before there was any hardware. I created a virtual front panel on an iPad using touch designer or something like that 
And so I was able to create a virtual mockup, put whatever knobs I wanted and send MIDI messages and then write code actually on the subfatty hardware to start doing new stuff. Okay, what happens if we add a second mod bus? What happens if we, you know, allow all of these new mod destinations that weren't in the subfatty? It was the same hardware, um, but running all of the modulations were done digitally, um, not because specifically so that they could be sent to any destination without having to have a big matrix of analog switches to make all those different mod destinations possible. Seems like a rapid way to prototype using software in that way. So yeah. you can just be like, that doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah, and so that was brilliant. We, it was, it, we were able to probably cut months off of the development time because we were able to use existing hardware that we already had and, you know, and mock up a virtual UI without needing to, without needing to design hardware yeah. for it. Um, and so then uh, we worked with, once we had the feature set, okay, we decided it's going to have two mod buses and these are going to be the mod sources and destinations. And, you know, this is, this is sort of how, how it's all going to come together. We got all of that working on the subfatty hardware uh, with the virtual panel. And then we were able to talk about, all right, what is the control surface going to be like? What controls are we going to bring out to the user and how are we going to arrange them? And uh, so that's a process that we always go through. Um, because of course the interface is a huge part as a musician, you know, that's, that's how you talk to the thing. That's how you interact with it. And so, uh, so it's very important that that go smoothly, that everything be intuitive, that you can sort of read it. Uh, one thing that we, um, the mini Moog is still a huge inspiration. The architecture of the mini Moog with, you know, oscillators on, well, from your perspective, this side, and then mixer here and filter here, envelopes here, uh, that has become a grammar of subtractive synthesis that virtually everybody knows, whether consciously or subconsciously. And so we always refer back to that. If you look at a panel, does it speak the language? Does it have that familiar grammar? And you can add new things, but as long as you do it in a way that is consistent, in a way that just you know fits and makes sense, um, and that's something, I don't know that it's ever been codified necessarily, but we've internalized it and we yeah. can talk about it and say that feels like it's in the right place. Um, to what and, extent yeah. would you like build something physically and then go, we've made a mistake and, and dial back and change it, things? It absolutely happens. We try not to do that. Yes. Um, so <laughs> Hence we, the iPad. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so we'll do, we'll do full scale drawings. Uh, we'll do foam mock-ups where you've got, you know, a piece of foam board and, you know, you're like sticking knobs in it with pins and moving like them around. Turning, right? Yeah. Imagining what would happen. Right. So, like so, so typically, the, you know, it starts with, uh, you know, Pen, pen, pen and paper sketches, um, and then we'll digitize those and do mock-ups and every, you know, we'll print them out and everybody can gather around and look at them. We'll mark those up. Um, and so our industrial designer is, uh, which is we've moved in-house over the past few years. We were working, um, working with um, independent contractors for industrial design. Yeah. And gradually, Axel Hartman and yes, Co. yeah, 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 Axel Hartman, and you know, we still have a great relationship with yeah, Axel. We love great. working with him, but uh, it's helped because of this this iteration that I'm describing. The ability to to all review something and make changes, uh, bringing that in house has allowed us to be a lot more nimble, and um, you know, it's more efficient for us. But so essentially, you know, we'll do a few rounds of from pen and paper sketch to printout to physical mockup. And only then will we actually make a first article of circuit boards. Yeah. Typically, the goal is to have the actual hardware controls, the knobs and switches. We want to get that right because that's the most expensive thing to do over. But very often, we'll find that uh, we can improve a design by just changing the, la the labeling. So we'll have right. the same physical knobs, but we'll say, hang on a minute, let's take this parameter that we thought we wanted on the panel. Turns out nobody, you know, we don't use that nearly as often as we thought we would, but there's this other parameter that would be much more useful to put in that position. I see, so literally change the function of the knob. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just change the overlay, change the text, make the same physical control do a different thing. Yeah. That's a very, very commonly, um, because that's something that you really, you can try to put yourself in the mindset of imagining that you're using a thing, yeah. but there's no substitute for the real experience. Yeah, I've had that with like people sending mock-ups of things like, what do you think? I'm like, I can't tell you until I physically exactly. can touch the Exactly. Thing. And yeah. so this goes back to what I was saying earlier about paying close attention to the experience of using the instrument. Um, so it's a very important part of our process once we have first article hardware, really getting in there and using it, letting musicians come in and use that, talking to people. You know, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to just hang out while a musician is using a new piece mm. of gear 
just sharing their enthusiasm, encouraging them when I see them hesitate, noting that yeah, and yeah. saying, aha, okay, that's, you know, um, and, and just, you know, just listening. And that was something that Bob emphasized was that, you know, one of the most important uh, parts of your role as a toolmaker is to listen, listen and observe and just let people have the experience that they're going to have and pay attention to what that's like. And, um, uh, and, and then from that, learn how to refine your process so that, uh, you know, to make that experience better and better. Yeah. So um, how do you arrive at the perfect feature set? And no such thing. Well, then, how do you avoid feature creep? Um, Especially on a subsequent 37, which is just like no holds barred. It does so much, but it obviously doesn't do everything. There are still some things that are in the menu. Yeah, uh, that is, I, I feel as though I'm still learning how to get that right. And one of my roles actually, um, occasionally I will call myself the feature creep. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but really, like I have a, I'm a maximalist. Yeah. My tendency is, is to think of every cool thing you could possibly do and try to fit it all in there somehow. Yeah. Um, sometimes that's not the right call. Sometimes that is, you know, you can, t you can absolutely take that too far and by adding more features actually make something less fun to use. Yeah. And I have done that before, unfortunately. I think, but I think that's, and it's important to point this out because I think people think they want the most features. They do think that. And it's like, I well, think that, well, I'm but like, I'm not I'm, always right. Exactly. But it's like, I think of the most indelible studio tools tend to be the simplest. So absolutely. LA2A, for example, two knobs and one of them is volume. Like. And the awesome. other one, it's the only, yeah, it's perfect, yeah. It's perfect. Yeah, and, and so really that's, um, Steve Dunnington is more of a minimalist and I'm more of a maximalist. And so between the two of us, we have a really nice dynamic of me suggesting too many features and him saying, no, nope, no, nope, yeah. sorry, that's, it, needs, it needs half as many as you just yeah. said. And the creative tension between those two perspectives helps us to arrive at a happy medium where, you know, at the very least, we've thought of everything and then pared it down yeah. and tried to, you know, tried to, tried to distill, it. distill yeah. exactly, yeah. distill it down to the absolutely incontrovertible best subset of everything we could possibly think of. That's so, like the case of the Mini Moog is an example of that was like, if you look at the modulars before it, there's an example of an instrument that is the perfect distillation of a modular. Mm -hmm. It's only what you absolutely needed to have fun. Yeah. It's as simple as possible, but no simpler. Yeah, it's perfect. So um, various other questions, including um, what do you say to the people who are like, if you only just put this one tiny little thing in, it would be so much better and it really wouldn't cost you much more, surely, to put that in. What do you say to those? It depends on whether or not it can be added to a menu. Yeah. And if it can be, usually I say, right, I'll stick it in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, if it's a hardware change, um, and again, that's one of the fascinating things about working on digitally controlled analog is that it's often a very open question. You know, someone comes up with some behavior that they want to see. They don't know whether it requires hardware or if it could be done in firmware. Oftentimes, we don't either until we really sit and think about it. There have been times where we design a piece of hardware. It's digitally controlled. It's analog circuits. And someone will come along, you know, weeks, months, or years later and say, oh, I had this great idea. I feel like if it could only do X. And sometimes we'll say, oh, well, yeah, I totally could do that actually all along. It's, yeah. you know, it, we just have to look at it from the right perspective. That's like the Minotaur uh, has sort of had, right. I feel like has had that kind um, of phenix from the edge. Well, it's actually kind of... the duophonic uh, capabilities of the Sub-37 is a mm. perfect example of that. That was something that was possible all along and it just required someone asking the right question. Well, what if, if I press two keys, can we split up the voltages that are going to the two oscillators and make them different? Well, yeah, actually we can. That would that would be great. We should totally do that. Yeah. And and so that was actually an Easter egg in the sub fatty for a year or two before the sub 37 came out. Yeah. There was a special you'd, you'd hold down these buttons and then you'd type in BOB in Morse code on a certain button on the panel <laughs> and it would unlock the secret duophonic <laughs> <Amazing>. mode. <laughs> oh wow. Uh, there are actually there are a number of Easter eggs in different Are there still sense. ones? In... There there are still oh, ones. There's... Oh. Yeah, the Murph has a really fun one that I like. Can you talk about how to find it? I've forgotten. Okay, <laughs> but it's in there. I would have to look in the code and, and remember how to do the Easter egg, but um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd also, just to make a, it's more of an observation really, I remember you posted on Facebook 
how when the subsequent 37 came out, you were like, to everyone who's buying a subsequent 37, I just want to let you know that you are actually buying a piece of me. <laughs> <laughs> the amount um, of work that yes. you put into that. No, I re- uh, so many long nights yeah. and, and so many days. Like truly, it was a labor of love for a year or so. And, and what, would yeah. you, what do you do with it now that you have a subs- subsequent 37? What is your sort of, what do you make with it? Um, well, uh, I certainly, I try to and aspire to and have made a lot of music with it over time. Right now, I'm sort of in another of the cycles where I'm so busy making a new musical instrument that I don't have a lot of time for making music. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I do have a studio at home. Uh, when it's not an R&D lab, it's my playground. Um, you know, I tend to make loopy, entrancing, uh, richly textural, interesting sonic explorations. Sometimes they have beats, sometimes they mm. don't. I feel like the development of the sequencer in the subsequent 37 feels like it, it responds to that. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, definitely like uh, Acid is, Acid Techno and, and that world of like small boxes with interesting sequencers that make cool noises mm. where like the interest is in how the sound evolves over time. Um, that's that's a, a happy place for me musically, yeah. and so so definitely all of the sequencers in the last several instruments have come from a place of you know spending uncounted hours uh, working in that environment and working in that style. And, yeah, and being a musician as well, yeah. I think, is kind of important as well. It absolutely well. It's because so I speak the language, yeah. and you know, so not only am I able to. Uh, you know, one of one of the things that we say is you never want to design something only for yourself, and that's true. You don't want to design something only for yourself. But if you get it, if you are design, if you are designing for yourself among other people, uh, it's still it's very helpful because you can find yourself in the situation of ah, I want to realize this creative idea, and here is how I get from A to B with that. Yeah. And knowing how to do that helps helps me and helps us because there are so many other musicians working as well. Um, you know, to speak that creative language and know how people are, are going to want to use these tools. So let's talk about the Moog One. Um, Absolutely. So I, yeah, just to make sort of the opening thing, it was that I was struck kind of from getting to play on the Moog One um, and sort of showing it off to people. I was demoing it to people um, over like three days. And there was sort of something that like, crystallized in my mind, which was quite striking, which is for a device that, you know, is given what synths cost in the sort of current marketplace is considered a premium instrument. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to just point out that even the cost of the Moog One compared to what synthesizers used to cost back in the day is like fractional in terms oh, of... Um, but considering something that is a, is a sort of premium instrument in that sense, and therefore by extension professional in the truest sense, I was struck by how it's actually one of the easiest to use synthesizers that Moog. Oh, that makes made. me so happy to <laughs> no, hear! True. Oh my goodness! Like because I own some, I own some other professional devices, like not to sort of name names, but well, I'll name one. But like the Yamaha TG77, which was the sort of the pinnacle of FM synthesis and a great, great synthesizer, but very difficult to use through its own interface. Yeah. It, is, it is a workstation designed to do so many different things and to be you know, a complete instrument in and of, in and of itself. Um, it's really not a fun thing to use, but, but the Moog One is. like So I, I wanted to ask you to talk a bit about the, the development of the Moog One and some of the sort of, um, the like, not tricks, but the kind of usability things, like the way that you apply modulation and the use of a menu and when to use a menu and when to use physical controls. Yeah, uh, an enormous amount of work went into that, so I'm very glad to hear that it had the intended result. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, the Moog One, even more than the Sub 37, uh, the the stated goal was, you know, think of absolutely everything. This there should be blue ocean between this and any other instrument. It should just, you know, absolutely set the bar, um, and. It should also be fun and easy to use and engaging, and, and um, how to balance those. Um, one of the things that we think about, uh, I would I describe the, the the method of programming something like that Yamaha is it's like building a ship in a bottle, yeah. essentially. You know, you have this very very small set of, of of hooks that you can use to touch the thing, and and then there's a, a million things on the other side of that, and you've got to use this tiny little little mail slot of options to get in and, and do a thousand things. 
Um, and so the principle that we, uh, that we applied to try to avoid having that problem was to keep everything as shallow as possible. Yeah. So you've got you know, yeah. a thousand things, how can you lay them out so that there are as few layers of depth, as, as little hierarchy as yeah. possible? Because navigating a hierarchy is a very unmusical activity. Yeah, you never, like with the little triangles, you literally just go one layer beneath. Yeah, and, and, and that was the goal, is can we, make, can we make this entire instrument only one layer of depth? And, and we did that by um, you know, first of all, we thought about it in terms of modules. Using the modular synth concept is helpful because that's one layer of organization where uh, you know everything associated with the sequencer you get to it in this space. Everything associated with the filters you get to it in this space, um, and so that gives you a nice visual orientation, a map to where all of the functionality lives. Um, and then we spent a lot of time. So we'd start out by saying, okay, this is every filter parameter that we can imagine wanting. And you know, we'll write them all down. And then we'll just look at that and say, okay, put on your musician hat, you are performing a piece of music with a synthesizer, let's put all of the parameters that you just know you're gonna reach out and grab in the yeah. middle of a piece, you know, what are you, what are you gonna need to change as a part of a performance? And so that was the number one organizing principle is of all the parameters that this thing's have, that this thing has, which ones are are performance parameters, yeah. things that, that as a part of an expression or a phrase or a lick, you're gonna to want to adjust in real time. And so you can draw a line and put all the parameters that meet that criterion on one side. Boom, that's what goes on the panel. And yeah. so that's your first, so you know, that you've got it now, your, your problem is half solved at that point because you figured out everything that you really need to control as a part of a performance, that's what has to go on the panel. Everything else, okay, we figure out what to deal with, what to do with that. And so in figuring out what to do with everything that we figured was either part of sound design or you'd adjust it once when you're setting up a sound and not again, or just not very often, um, then the decision was how do we make those things easy to navigate? And that was where we came up with not having you know, one menu, so you go to the master menu and then you scroll to filter and then you go to a sub menu and then you know, didn't like that idea. So instead of having one master menu, we distributed all of the entry points to the extra functions and we organized it by module. I wanna mess with the filter. Okay, boom, there's a button that takes me directly to all the other filter parameters. There's a button that takes me to all of the LFO1 parameters. So again, by not clustering things together, by distributing them and putting them in sensible places where it's logical to go looking for them, then you've avoided another, like that's a decision that a musician doesn't have to make. It's just, you, you, you get rid of that thinking process. And, uh, and so then we thought, all right, how can we organize, all right, so you're in a menu, you didn't have to think about getting there, that's a good start. Now, how do we make sure that within that, it's as flat an organization as possible? And so we, we have a few soft knobs and there's one menu that puts things to those knobs and whatever you can see, whatever, whatever the knob says it's going to adjust, that's what it's going to adjust. Uh, and so we made it to where it was essentially, you know, one step to find the, the category of thing and then all the things that you want to adjust are in one layer. Mm. And that was that way, and then it's, you get all of that per synth. So there's something like, oh, I don't know, 3,000 parameters or something like that. Really? <laughs> um, because there's three layers of that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, are, there are, in any case, multiple thousands of parameters, and we've laid them all out flat with one layer of depth. It's crazy. What are your favorite features or the things that you're proudest of that are in that machine? Oh, gosh. Um, there's a lot, really. Um, how, just the experience of how easy it is to use, as you described, that is a favorite feature for yeah. sure. Um, I really love how easy it is to set up complex modulations. That's um, something that was, we knew was going to be one of the most powerful aspects of this instrument is the ability, you know, you've got all of these oscillators, you've got all these layers of sound, and the ability to have complex and subtle motion to all of those things is really what brings it to life as an instrument. That's yeah. what makes it sonically pleasing and interesting. And so um, the, the intuitive nature of like, okay, I'm gonna press a button on LFO1 and I'm gonna turn the knob that I want to wiggle with LFO1. Boom, it's done, it's doing it. Yeah. Um, you know, that, just how easy that is and how fast and how rewarding. 
I was struck also by playing around with the, by building up sounds in layers as well, and then getting to a point where it was just starting to make something that was like a complete track by itself. Yes. And it's just like, this is really nice. Like, it didn't occur to me that this is, doesn't even have to be part of an ensemble. There's enough power in here that it can be its own instrument. Absolutely, own absolutely. Way. You can have a pad, a bass, and a lead all evolving, and yeah, you just press play and sit back and you've got most of a track. Yeah, that track, uh, there's a preset called Diamond Spaces that's my favorite one. Just play like low black notes on that and it just sounds like sort of some kind of 80s Miami sort of oh, vibe. I perfect. feel like I'm in a car like cruising late at night. It's just like, <laughs> awesome. that's it, it's, it's rad. <laughs> Cool. Did you, I mean, to what extent did you look at the memory Moog and sort of classic Moog polysynths for inspiration? Or were you just kind of, because it obviously looks like a memory Moog, mm -hmm. but it's, I, I understand it's not a clone of a memory Moog. Oh, it's very much not a clone of a memory Moog. The important thing with respect to the memory Moog was we wanted to be certain that it could do everything that a memory Moog could do by and large. Yeah. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure that it would have that brash tone, that it would have those filter responses. Um, you know, definitely it had to have three oscillators. Um, so the memory Moog was, uh, it was a jumping off point. Like if we came out with a new polysynth and there was something that a memory Moog could do that it couldn't, that would have been a bad it's look. not cool, is it? Yeah. It's, like, yeah. <laughs> it's not a good look. You're so, pushing forward so, so yeah, so we definitely, we, the memory Moog was, you know, the baseline. Yeah. It has to be equivalent to a memory Moog and then we can go nuts and make it do all these amazing other things. Um, I actually, I looked at a lot of polysynths. Uh, the sequencer, one of my inspirations was the JX3P mm. because it was an example of a step sequencer that's super easy to use. The SH-101 is sort of one of my go-to, like this is a perfect step sequencer for what it does. Um, you know, there's things it doesn't do, but what it does, it basically can't be improved on. It's just perfect. Um, so that was that was my jumping off point for the sub thirty seven was let's make it as easy to use and as powerful as an SH one hundred one and then add other cool stuff like gate length and ratcheting and blah 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 uh, and do a do a notes um, and so the JX three P was an example of a polyphonic step sequencer that was basically as easy to use mm. uh, and so that was sort of a starting point and then of course because we had a screen we could do graphical editing there was all kinds of other cool stuff that we could do you know parameter lock style. Uh, you know, parameter sequencing, yeah. all that stuff. But, um, you know, so we spent, there were probably six six or seven years of development in on, behind the Moog One. Uh, we were working on it for, you know, there were years where people would say, Moog, you've got to make a polysynth. And we'd say, yeah, we probably should. I, I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one day. Maybe, maybe. next year. <laughs> <laughs> right. Meanwhile, feverishly working on yeah, one yeah, in the yeah. background, telling no one. Um, and so part of that, you know, the, in the early days, um, you know, I had a full, whole folder, folder called opposition research. I had a whole folder of like that user's was, manuals. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and, and so, yeah, I, I would just obsessively read user's manuals of other synths, not necessarily to cop their ideas directly, mm. but just to build, you know, it's a way of us, you know, essentially if you're surveying the history of other instruments that have been made, you're surveying effectively like thousands of musicians whose yeah. priorities are reflected in what those instruments yeah. turned out to like be. Like what is, and almost distilling, what is the average of exactly. all of those requests? Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, so if you, know, you look at 10 instruments and you see their commonalities, you can say, aha, these things are clearly important. Yeah. Um, and so, so it was really more about uh, finding that common ground and finding you know, that sort of sense of priorities rather than copying individual features from individual instruments. I sort of I had a vaguely worded question, which was, I can't remember my exact wording, was basically, how do you balance the past while looking to the future? But I, I point out specifically at what you're saying there, which is, I'll rephrase it, is just how do you invent things that don't exist? You know, how can you invent a feature that no one has ever put in a synth um, before, do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, um, well, I think that just obsessively thinking about all of the possibilities and being super curious and, and inspired when you see, you know, when you see examples of really cool music tech in the world, um, following that inspiration and also going out in the world and doing non-music tech related stuff, you know, living an interesting life and being engaged in the world, talking to people about all kinds of things, being curious, um, those are sort of the broad outlines of things that help to have original thoughts. And having original thoughts generally and nurturing the creative process generally is, you know, is, is the necessary work that you have to do to have original ideas within this particular sphere. 
Have an open mind. Yeah, yeah. Have an open mind. Be curious. Be inspired and be interested, um, and then see where that leads you. Mm. You know, um, you know, and and it helps to you know you take something that may be a little quirky, maybe a little bit uh, you know of a happy accident, and then dig into that and see where it leads you. Um, as a musician, one of the ways that I compose is I'll start with just exploring sound, just no in, no goal in mind. And then I'll hear something, it'll jump out, and it'll, it'll make me think, ooh, that makes me think of this other sound that it, I, it, I don't hear it yet, but in my mind's ear, I'm hearing it going along, I'm inspired by that random creative process. And so then a piece takes form by listening to where it leads you. Mm. And the same is true with a technological artifact. Ideally, you have an open mind and you're curious and you look at it and you think, where does this, where does this lead me? And sometimes if you listen to that and you pay attention, just like with music, it'll lead you in a new direction that you wouldn't have gotten to intentionally, but you got there by paying attention and being present in the moment and seeing, seeing where it takes you. So final question, um, what do you think is the, f for you, what would you like to see as the future of music technology? What do you think, what do you think we can improve on? Where do you think things could be going? Well, um, without this, saying what you're working on right now, okay, no, <laughs> which you I, can say, but uh, uh, this is probably a curveball, and I'm not working on this, and I'm not convinced that it will necessarily exist within my lifetime. But per, if you're asking personally, where would I like to see yeah. music technology go? I just want a line out in my head that I can plug in and oh, think well, of sounds and then record them. <laughs> that's what I want. Yeah, brain to techno interface. <laughs> yes, exactly. Perhaps like coming back more to, to the physical. What do you think? Where do you think? Oh, that's you think very so, physical. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But how do you think we can improve on synths at this point? Sure. Well, um, uh, I believe that the analog versus digital debate is increasingly irrelevant. Like, that was a really fun battle to have 10 years ago. And it's like it's over. Mm. Um, and everybody both won. won. Everybody won. Everybody won. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that... Um, you know, breaking down that false dichotomy and doing the things that analog does best and the things that digital does best at the same time and together and supporting and enhancing each other, I think that there's a ton of, of possibility there that we're just, you know, we've only just won that debate because digital has gotten so good that it's not worth arguing whether it's better or worse than analog anymore. So now we're at a point where they're both amazing mm -hmm. and we can start to do hybrid things that where they're interacting with each other in real time and you've got you know, analog things that are influencing your digital circuits and digital processes that are influencing your control voltages. Um, I think that we're going to be able to weave those things together in a more and more interconnected fashion that is a really synergistic mm -hmm. and it's going to allow some mind-blowing new possibilities. So that's, that's where I think uh, the, the, the future is right now. I look forward to seeing them coming out. Uh, ladies thank and gentlemen, you. Amos Gaines, thank you very much, mate. Thank you all. Thanks for listening. Oh, yeah, buddy. There you have it. Myself and Amos in the theatre in Durham, North Carolina, talking about synths, uh, Moog synths. Um, and yeah, wasn't he great? Like, what a great... I just love listening to his voice. He's got such a kind of sharp, lucid way of talking and thinking things through. I think they're in very, very good hands. And I think it's probably no secret that with people like that they kind of have been doing some pretty damn sweet machines over the last few years certainly if you've spent any time with subsequent 37 grandmother and the moog one they got good brains very good brains <laughs> and yeah i love that thing he said uh, talking about bob moog and the early days he says i owe what was it i owe a lot of my success to that spirit of generosity and openness that if i have a question he would whip out a pen and paper and he would explain the problem or the solution. He would explain the situation so that Amos learned and was able to go and grow his own knowledge. There wasn't a sense of superiority or what's the word? The kind of fear, you know, fear that if you give away your secrets, oh, you know, will you diminish yourself? Like, nah, 
that's not that was not Bob Moog's philosophy. Quite the opposite. He was always willing to explain, always patient and kindly. So I think that's something that we should all bear in mind is never be afraid to give away your secrets because ultimately, certainly in the case of music, you know, I do think about this from time to time where I'm like, eh, you know, like with the iPhone thing, I'm like, ah, it's quite good. Like, and it's very simple. Uh, so, uh, this seems to work. If I give this away, then people will do it. And the reality is I realized it's one thing to know how something's done, but that doesn't mean that you have the ear. It's not the gear. It's the ear. The ear is what makes the melody. And so just because someone understands or can use the same tools does not mean they're going to use them in the same way. So don't be afraid to tell people what you're doing, how you did it, because they won't copy your music because they can't, because only you can make your music. So share your knowledge and let's all benefit. That's it for this month. I'll see you soon. I've got one lined up for next month. I want to thank Amos Gaines and all of the folks at Moog for A, giving up your time and B, allowing me to share this. And I would also like to thank our sponsors, Signal Sounds in Glasgow, who rule and have very, 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 very kindly continue to sponsor this podcast, which begs me to ask the question, if you are a brand and you probably will want to be a brand in this sector of synths and modular universe, would you like to sponsor this podcast? Yes, you would. Tens of thousands of interesting people listen to this podcast, and so you could advertise your beautiful, beautiful products to them. Get in touch. You can find my details, and let's talk. But as for me and you, listener, our time is up for one more month, and all that is left is for me to say, you're the best. See you next month.